Hi, Christina. Welcome to the Good Mood Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Christina. So we are going to talk methylation, folic acid, folate. I was taking the, um, so I took a couple of years ago, the Methylation 101 course with you and um, Krista Doherty. And, and who else was giving that course? I forget the names. Oh, so yeah. And so, yeah, Sonia and Danielle. Yeah, it's so good. And I just was rewatching a couple of them and saw you in it. And I'm like, we got it. We got a chat because we haven't covered methylation, folic acid, folate, SNPs in this podcast yet. And so maybe we can do a little methylation 101. Or, yeah. I mean, I feel like that course was methylation 201. So <laughs> it was a little bit. What is it for like the average person? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because it was still, it was pretty good, pretty informative. And like it, it got into some depth, obviously it's, there's so much deeper that you can go, but um, yeah, maybe we can start off by just talking about maybe first of all, what a SNP is. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> we'll climb the, we'll climb the ladder slowly. Yeah. So maybe it's, maybe it's even back one more step. It's like nature versus nurture. There we go. So <laughs> our genes. So what we inherit from our family. So from our mom and from our dad, um, are sort of that backbone or that blueprint of what our body is. And that sort of determines, you know, do you have curly hair? Do you have brown, brown eyes or blue eyes? Or how tall might you be? Um, and that's sort of one layer. So we like know that this is sort of like the blueprint of like what you are, but even in cases of like twins or fraternal twins or brothers and sisters, we see there's so much differentiation. And some of that comes from, you know, which of those genes are turned on and off. And then also, how does the body um, receive the environment that they live in? So, you know, if you were born in Europe or you were born um, in North America, there's a lot of different things that you're exposed to. And so that's sort of this like nature nurture. So our genes sort of determine both our personality and behavior, but also how we, how we look and how our body reacts. Um, but then we also have our environment that brings in sort of this other component, including like our lifestyle choices. So, um, you know, do we choose to smoke? What are the foods that we eat? How often do we go outside? Do we exercise? So it's sort of this nice combination of both of them. Mm -hmm. So a SNP, um, which is a sickle nucleotide polymorphism, which is why we never say it because it's so long. Yeah. Um, is basically like a code, a piece of the code inside your DNA. And so um, we know companies like 23andMe, they like give you sort of this access to like, what is your genetic code? So what are all those little numbers and letters that make up who you are? It's similar to like how a computer has a code. Um, and in the case of a SNP, it's a, a little tiny piece of code that dictates how your body may react in a situation if nothing else um, in fact affected it. So nothing in your environment affected it. And they're made of, um, of these little combinations of uh, nitrogen bases. So our DNA has like four nitrogen bases and they kind of work in combination. Mm -hmm. What should happen is they're sort of like a, like a zipper, right? And so uh, you want the zipper to always have every one of the little um, keys moving together or else you get stuck, right? You get stuck in your coat, you get stuck in your pants, super awkward. <laughs> um, when your DNA is replicating, it sort of just like zips one off, zips one off, zips one off. Um, and as long as everything is moving smoothly, things are going well. It doesn't mean that everyone's zipper is exactly the same. And so sometimes those pairs are... Um, what we expect and what we don't expect. So things like uh, 23andMe will tell you, um, you know, are you the wild type? So wild type doesn't always mean good or bad. It just means this is what most people are. So this SNP is what most people are. Um, and if it is uh, not wild type, so you have one of the characters that are changed. So example would be like the wild type is character GG not wild type might be character GA. And so GA means that you're like half what everyone else is and half something a little bit different. Sometimes it affects how it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you are then AA, then you're exact opposite of what everyone else is. So you're probably in a smaller pool of people. Um, again, it's not always harmful. Even in things like disease, we know that there's a third of the population because of those genetic changes is actually immune. So there's some, there's some benefit in having 
DNA that isn't exactly the same as everyone else. Right. And they're not, they're different from mutation, I think. And I think this took me a while to understand that. Can you maybe talk, tell us the difference just quickly? Like, yeah. So a, a, a mutation or um, something that, so a SNP itself is just like, what is the genetic code? And then um, a variation in that. So some people will call it like mutation or substitution or deviation or all, there's all kinds of different names. Um, is when one of those expected expected numbers or sorry expected letters is different, um, and what it does is it actually changes the shape of the enzyme. So each of those little codes, even though it, we think about DNA as like a blueprint, it's actually like a blueprint for how the machine works. And so if you have a change in the machine, it may mean that instead of a round bolt going in, now only a square bolt goes in. And so that means that your body reacts a little bit differently than my body acts on the same, in the same situation because our, the hole that our, our thing is going in is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I really like that, actually. That's a really good molecular biology 101 after <laughs> many, many molecular biology courses. This is the, this has made the most sense that I've ever heard anyone explain this. Yeah. So it's essentially like our DNA makes proteins in our body. And, and so when you have a little bit of variation in your DNA, it's going to perhaps change the shape of the protein and maybe how it functions or maybe not. And but it can be yeah. like a positive thing. So sometimes like having a gene actually affords you more protection and so having that deviation is actually a good thing it's not always a bad thing and i think that's when we think about mutation we're like oh mutant bad not good um in fact mutations are actually super good right right well i think that that was darwin's whole thing right it's like the mutations that that um help us benefit from the environment it depends on the environment so if the environment supports a certain variation in your dna then it's yeah. good. Yeah. You know? Like if so you, you live in long beak or short beak. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Is it better to have white fur in the north where everything is white? Yes. <laughs> or is it better to have black fur or whatever, brown fur? So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think though that SNPs are probably not that, like the difference in the expression of SNPs is not like hair color, eye color. It's not that precise, is it? It's not that obvious. Yeah. yeah. It's smaller and it's like not. Um, it's sort of like making a stew or a soup. Like if you had carrots or you didn't have carrots, it changes the flavor a little bit and maybe like you expected carrots to be in there, but it doesn't make it not good. <laughs> right. <laughs> so sometimes it's like, but if you didn't have carrots and you didn't have meat and you didn't have potatoes and all you have is gravy, well, it's like not a stew anymore, right? And so there are like small variations that can happen and it doesn't change the outcome very much. And then there are larger variations that happen that can change that. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's like millions, right? There's millions of combinations and options and everything else. And so even when we get back a report, um, some of my sickest patients actually have the best genes. Mm -hmm. And so the genes don't actually dictate the sickness, but they do give us some insight in how the body runs when everything is good. Mm -hmm. um, and so in their case, we're like, oh, if we clear up the sickness, like everything else should actually just work. Um, versus someone else who might be sick and also has some gene stuff. So we're like, oh, there's some like sickness. But then after that, there's probably some other stuff that just with help would actually make you feel better on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Like your baseline will be better once we deal with mm -hmm. this other thing. But it's not necessarily predicting that you're sick. The sickness could be related to some other things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it can, it can, like for instance, we know that there's gene mutations that make you more susceptible to certain illnesses. So we know like things like Lyme disease, for instance, like there are some genetic mutations that people that get bit by a tick have a harder time clearing Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that you will get Lyme disease. It means like in this environment, if you are also stressed and run down and your body isn't able to, to um, attack the virus when it comes into your body, then yeah, you might have a harder time getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's like the genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. <laughs> Who said that? That was Chris. Um, oh man, I forget his name. Uh, Dr. Lynch says that. And Dr. Lynch, yeah, a lot of people, yeah. Because So now we can maybe get into functional genomics. So there's this whole field of medicine, functional medicine, where we actually analyze SNPs. So you, yeah. you look at people's DNA and then, and then can... Um, tailor healthcare plans according to what 
people's DNA is expressing. Hmm. Yeah, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, how does it work? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's yeah. Complicated, but also interesting, right? So part of it is like opening up under the hood of your car and being able to see like, you know, what, what do I have inside to play with and, and how does my body work? Um, and in that, it tells us some of those like machines, right? What are the things that work best in certain machines based on what your blueprint looks like? Um, and so um, they work in kind of a bunch of different ways. There are some that are like very, very broad. And so they'll just tell you a whole list of SNPs and SNPs um, and um, their, their footprints are all the like codes. So they'll be coded like MTR, CBS, MTFR. It becomes like, it seems like it's like a second language in and of itself, but they're um, just short forms for really long um, names. Um, and they're pretty easy to like, search and Google and at least find something about it. Um, some of the main ones are easy to find enough in, in English. Um, so there's sort of that. There's someone that will actually go through and like look at all those patterns and see what they are. There's also some um, programs where you can take your data from things like 23andMe, plug it in and it'll say, oh, you have, you know, you pr you're more prone to fast stretch fibers or you, you might be more likely to be lactose intolerant or maybe, um, things like fats don't work as well in your body. And that's like a calculation based on this um, dynamic of like, what do you have compared to other people like that? And then what does that express like? It's not always like 100%, but it's a good place to start if you're like, I really don't know what to do. Oh, this says like, given my genetic pattern, this thing might be really good for me. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting. So in my practice, um, people will come in and there's a, a gene pattern called MTHFR. So MTHFR is a pretty common one that people know about. So there's lots and lots of writing about it. I know last time I checked PubMed, there's like more than a million articles about it. So it's like studied and researched in lots of different ways. And uh, people will come in and they're like, oh, I have MTHFR and I did this and it, and it was awful. Like, so everyone else has this amazing experience from it and mine was awful. And the awful actually tells us more about their body. So we're like, oh, okay, so this should work if everything was working well, but because it didn't work, that means there's something standing in the way. It's like there's somebody blocking the machine from getting the bolt inside. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes actually having something that didn't work actually gives us more information about what's going on in the body than something that doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so this whole field of genomic medicine sort of started around this piece, but we do know there's some research from since at ChemH where they're trying to figure out based on people's genetic patterns, how well should the drugs work and which drugs should work for which people. Now it's interesting because they're doing it strictly based on genes and not on that other layer of like diet, environment, trauma, everything else that's happened. And so it'll be interesting to see like how does that work because it has to basically skip this whole like what's happened to me as a person step and just work on this who am I as a blueprint step. Maybe helpful, maybe not helpful, or maybe based on what happens out of that, then we can go back and say, okay, well, what if we fix this lifestyle piece? Um, does that make the medication work better? And I can say from practice, like I have lots of people who um, have like medications for anxiety and they have to go up and up and up. And then once we fix that lifestyle piece, they're like, oh, my medication is works a million times better. I can actually bring it down and still get the same benefit or more benefit than I was getting before. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, actually. You know, so yeah, I've, I've had a lot of patients come in saying that they went to CAMH, the Canadian Association for Mental Health, and they were like, oh, I was tested, my DNA was tested to tell me which medication I should be on in terms of, it, it, it was like which type, like which type of SSRI maybe, or a different class of medication. And a lot of them were told, none of them work for you. Um, and, and I asked a, a friend who works in genetics, um, who does genetic analysis on uh, mostly newborn babies or preborn babies, fetuses. And it's like this whole field called pharmacogenomics, you know, and, um, and I was wondering about the science behind it because I'm like, it seems so new, you know, and they're telling people whether or not they can take a medication, what kind of medication they can take just based on their genetics. And I was like, I didn't know that they had that much information to give you that cut and dry answer. And then what you're saying is even more interesting where it's like, you're bypassing all this, all these other steps and you're going almost like right to the source, looking at the blueprint. It's like if you went to a contractor and you're like, okay, you know what? Um, 
you know, like you, you had this analogy of the house, right? The blueprint for the house. And it's like, oh, you know what? I like, I just, the, the lighting in my house isn't, isn't that great. And it's like, okay, let's just see the blueprint. And then, but like what your analogy was, was like, there could be this giant building across the street. That's not going to show up in the blueprint. That's blocking all your light. And so yeah. maybe a tree in your yard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like the blueprint may be like, well, the windows look great. You know, you've got a lot of light. <laughs> According to these blueprints, you should be getting tons of light. Or or maybe you do find information in the blueprint. You're like, oh, there are no windows in your house. Maybe that's why you don't have any light yeah. coming in, like, you know. I, I think all information is helpful. I think we just always need to put it in context of like, what does this tell us? And is this like an absolute, which in medicine we all know there's no absolutes. And will this work for everyone? Probably not. Um, but could it give us more information so we could make better decisions? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes is the helpful piece if we are like, oh, okay. And honestly, I think that the people that actually things like don't work for it, that's actually more information for me. Like that's actually better information than someone who takes something and says like, I didn't really notice a difference. Someone who takes something and says, oh my gosh, that made me so anxious. And I'm like, cool, now I know what's wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, because now I understand what part of the machine isn't working versus um, what your blueprint is. I, I can see your blueprint, but I don't understand how your body works until something aggravates it. And then, or there's some thing that happened that you like casually mentioned that I'm like, ah, that's, that's the insight. Like that's the piece where we need to look at it. And that's so exciting. That, that was a really exciting uh, thing that I took away from the Methylation 101 course is how um, you guys who were delivering the course were so excited about aggravations and using aggravations as part of the data, almost yeah. more so than the blueprint itself. It was like, oh, this is really great because now, and that, that's like, that's individual medicine. It's what we do at its finest, right? It's like, you know, we're trying to figure out what your perfect cocktail is. And so if you're reacting to B vitamins, that could give us tons of information. I had a woman, um, her therapist checked her for the MTHFR gene because she was really depressed and very anxious. So she had both anxiety and depression and she was positive. So she was positive in the way that she was like homozygous positive. So both of, it means that the gene, instead of working at hundred percent, probably was working at like 30%. So the therapist was like, oh, well, the remedy for this is putting in methylfolate, put in methylfolate. So she put in methylfolate and it went wild. Like she was like crazy anxious. And then she fell and she was like super depressed. And she was like, if this is supposed to help, like, why is it so much worse? And I was like, oh, I'm like, it's because you either have some kind of bad gut bugs because our gut bugs, so inside our gut actually can take something that's positive and beneficial to us and turn it into something that's toxic to us. Um, just by the virtue of like, it's the way that they're working because they're working to feed themselves. They're not really worried about our well-being. Um, or that she had metal toxicity and she's like, I don't, I don't want to like play the guessing game. Like, let's just test both. And she had crazy, so she had she had grown up in the Middle East and had like crazy toxicity, like it was the most I've ever seen on any one test that came back. And her gut bugs were crazy, and so in the end, she was like super overwhelmed. And I was like, okay, let's just try some like diet changes. And like diet changes alone made it a her anxiety was a million times better, her depression was way better, and she was able to take folate. And we didn't even address any of the other stuff at that point. It was just like. What are some things that we could do that would just help her to feel a bit better so that she could investigate further? Mm. So it's not always like you have to get all these layers and deep and intense. Um, Sometimes it's just like being able to look at that and be like, okay, it's probably this or this. And then, and then I was like, okay, well, let's just try this like diet thing that'll help both of those and see what happens. And she was like, oh, I'm a million times better. Mm. That's Mm. way better than expected it to be. Um, But but it can't happen. Yeah. It's like the, the low hanging fruit, right? Like we can get all complex and order testing and do all kinds of things. And then really, you know, let's do some basic diet stuff and see how far we get. Yeah. And at least we know, like, if we haven't done that, we have to, at some point, you know, yeah. it's, again, it's like the foundations on your house. You're like, okay, like back to the house analogy, like, okay, you, you know, we have can, floors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We still need floors. Yeah. We still need windows. We still need walls, foundations, et cetera. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And you don't know. I mean, so we can, we can, it's interesting, right? So you're like, okay, so you have a 30% re- and we're going to get into MTHFR because I, yeah. I think that's a really good thing to get into, especially when we're thinking about mental health and mood, but it's like, okay, so yeah, the enzyme that metabolizes folate is not working at hundred percent. 
And so it feels like, okay, let's just, you know, replace it. Let's just do something to fix it. But like you said at the beginning, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like these snips are not necessarily like a, a, a shots fired, right? It's, it's maybe a loaded gun, but then when you have gut dysbiosis, heavy metal toxicity, then maybe it becomes a problem, you know, and you can figure that out by supplementing and then it's not going well. It's like, okay, so there's something else going on. Yeah. I yeah. usually never tell people initially that it could go wrong. I'm just like, just take this and like, tell me what happens. And then they'll be like, they'll either be like good, like no one tells me anything. And I'm like, okay, that was an, and then, or the bad people are like, oh my God, this crazy thing happened. Was this supposed to happen? And I was like, was it supposed to happen? But now yeah. I know more. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I'm excited that it happened. There's lots of good information here. Yeah, that's a difficult, I know that the, <laughs> that was part of the course too. It was like how you sort of dance around those issues, right? Especially with anxiety, like with patients with anxiety, I'm always scared to say too much about aggravations. I mean, we definitely have, like, as, as part of our informed we have to express that it could be disposed to, right? Or like, oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. But I think, you know, what I, what my experience has been, even personally, the nocebo effect, right? The opposite of the placebo effect, where if you expect a bad reaction, you can kind of call it oh, into being. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you like, don't want to set the stage too much for that. It's like, take this. And if you go a little bit crazy, call me. It's like, let's just see what happens. <laughs> Take this B vitamin. People know if it's not good, they call. <laughs> yeah, they sell this at, at shoppers, so it's not gonna it's not yeah. gonna kill you. It's a natural substance. It just you might feel a little bit off. Yeah. So let's talk about MTHFR, which uh, stands for not what you might think, <laughs> which is the, the mother <laughs> effer gene. Reductase. Yeah, yeah. What is it? So it's uh, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, not motherfucker. <laughs> but sometimes it is. But sometimes, yeah, sometimes it is. Yeah, especially when it's not working well or it's causing aggravations. Yeah, so maybe you let's. So, um, I think that the reason why this gene started to get studied so much is that it plays a huge role in the way that our body makes energy, but also like controls mood and shifts everything forward. And so I always think about it. It's too bad it's a podcast feel. We'll have to describe what it looks like. But essentially, there are, are two wheels on a bike. And so you, in order for the bike to move forward, you need both of those wheels to move at the same speed and in the same direction. Methylation is a little bit different because there's two wheels and they do intersect, but they actually go in opposite directions. And so one feeds into the other, which like moves things forward. And so a little bit more like gears on the clock, but I think bicycle tires makes us think about speed better. Mm -hmm. And what happens sometimes in um, methylation difficulty, which is our body taking in folate and using it to spin one of the tires, is that if we can't bring in folate or we can't move it at a consistent rate, then instead of the tire spinning, it feels like it's stuck. So it's like locked into the bike rack. And so we have one part of our body that's moving forward super, super fast, and the other part that's still stuck in. So kind of like riding a stationary bike, except that you didn't mean to ride a stationary bike. And so that's sometimes what anxiety feels like. It's like this runaway hamster wheel where it doesn't feel like everything's connecting. And that's one of the ways that we can see um, methylation come out when it doesn't work very well is that sort of feeling of like out of control or lack of control and that there's nothing you can do to unlock the bike piece. Um, methylation itself is taking folate from our external world. So that's in our leafy green vegetables that everyone loves and hates. <laughs> the ones that are like more bitter, the better, darker green, the better. And raw, um, right? They, they should be raw. Yeah, raw most. I mean, like you get more ingredient from raw if you cook them. You still get some. Um, and you bring it into the body and it goes through several steps. So there's actually like seven steps before your body can actually use it in a form that helps to spin the wheel. And so along that way, every one of those steps has SNPs and genes that can be mutated or slowed down, which means that the ingredients don't always pass very evenly from one to another. So think about like a factory. So if, um, there's like that uh, Lucia Ball in the chocolate factory, like a, that old movie. And um, she, instead of collecting the chocolates and like putting them into the boxes, like starts stuffing them in her hat, right? So the next person who expects the box of chocolates to come down the train is like, where's the box of chocolates? Where's the box of chocolates? So same thing kind of happens in our body. If 
it can't pass between the genes very easily, then we get less and less and less hopefully down. Mm -hmm. And so MTHFR is like one of the genes that people will talk about because it's one that we know a lot more about. And it's um, one that can be tested on its own. So you don't have to go through these like crazy genetics tests. Um, so that therapist, for instance, tested it. Um, or it can be tested as part of, it, it comes up in part of 23andMe. It's interesting because most of the research is done on two variations of it. And each variation has, so there's like the letter codes and then there's the number codes. Um, and the number codes tell us if there's like what it's kind of expected to be and then you see what you are. There's only two that are studied very well, but if you actually look at an actual full panel, there's actually like 10 or 12 different MTHFR stamps. And so even if you have two that are red and all the rest are green, red meaning that it's slowed down and green meaning that it's like kind of what everyone else's does, um, we don't know what that does. It's like, you're missing the carrots and potatoes out of the stew, but is the stew still okay? Maybe, um, or maybe not, right? right. And so, I mean, sweet potatoes, it might be fine. Yeah. yeah. Depends what else what else is moving in there, and so we don't always know entirely how much, how something is affected, um, but we do know that there's some commonality. So there are conditions like um, there's actually a giant list of conditions that are related to methylation and folate status. Um, so there's like ADD, ADHD, addictions, allergies, Alzheimer's. Um, diabetes, dementia, depression, Lyme disease, we talked about earlier, fertility issues, um, strokes, thyroid, tongue ties, bipolar. So like the list is actually quite large. Um, and when we think about all of those different conditions in the body, it's really about not getting enough energy. So my body doesn't have enough energy or isn't moving at a consistent rate that I try to do something or my body tries to do something to accommodate. So addiction is like a good example, right? If I don't make enough energy, the methylation folate cycles actually um, make something that's called, um, what's the easiest way to explain this? <laughs> methylation and folate cycles, their product that they make is something called SAM, and SAM, um, SAM is acetylmethionine, um, actually helps with our dopamine. So when we're not making enough, we don't get enough dopamine. So addiction is really about seeking dopamine to make that reward piece feel better. Mm -hmm. And so it's our body just trying to compensate for something that is not very, working very well. And so lots of times we can see if, if we can make those tires spin in the way that it's effective for that person, then the call for looking for dopamine from outside the body reduces. Mm -hmm. And so we can see kind of how you know, shifting one thing can actually shift many things. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, we know that um, there are things like autism, for instance, where we can definitely improve the body by making that methylation meal better, but it doesn't mean autism goes away. Um, it just means that it becomes less um, dictating of how your behavior is every day. Right, like the symptoms of it. Like I was doing research actually on oxytocin methylation and oxytocin, the, the can, it's sort of like the, the love hormone, but also connects to verbal acuity because it's our connection, you know? And so, um, uh, it was, you know, so there's the, the meth methylation can improve oxytocin status, which then improves, improves, uh, verbal acuity and connection. And there's like these things that, that it starts off really small and then it can lead to these changes on a macro level. And you're like, it's not curing autism or getting rid of autism, but some of these symptoms that could be um, intrusive or problematic are lessened maybe if the gears are moving or is that well, right? Yeah. Even an autism or addiction, like a lot of it is that hamster, an, an anxiety, right? It's that hamster wheel effect where it's just like, I can spin this wheel, but I can't get off of it. And so if we can put in the ingredients that help the wheel to spin in uniformity with the one that connects with it, then we see that like we can kind of get off the hamster wheel and each time we can kind of get off the hamster wheel a little bit more and mm. more. Um, and so it's that energy path that then leads us to being able to use that energy in our body. So things like um, a good example is uh, in autism, we'll see that kind of children will stare off into space and things that are like scrolling or moving seem to keep their attention a lot easier. Mm. It's because 
their eyes actually don't have to focus in on something because every time we focus in on something, our eye has to use energy to do that. So something that's moving or scrolling is a little bit easier because the eye doesn't have to recalibrate each time. And so reading something like on a piece of paper becomes super complicated. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's because you're looking at something stagnant and then the eye has to be tracking versus something that's just kind of, it's almost like that. I'm thinking of attention. So I, I see this a lot with patients where they're like, there's this, um, this comorbidity with ADHD and addictions. And like you were saying, this, this dopamine, this need to, <laughs> this need to renew dopamine and this need to kind of get enough dopamine is impaired because the body isn't producing it. This is a dog drinking water. <laughs> Very loudly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so our the ability to to sort of like get enough dopamine is is isn't uh happening inherently and so we're trying from the environment to grab it like you said so it could be gambling it could be uh, alcoholism it could be driving your car really fast i've had patients with even porn addictions things like that and um and then with adhd there's often this connection with the dopamine which is like helpful for attention and and focus and um and so people often be addicted to like things that are that are constantly moving like instagram or tv or just like the next thing like a squirrel you know kind of where the attention just goes to whatever is moving so it's an in interesting when you're talking about the eyes tracking it's kind of the same thing with uh where we point our focus mentally and uh and i love that description of how um folate metabolism is actually driving a lot of that or lack of folate metabolism Hmm. Sorry, that was loud. Someone above me <laughs> is trying to drive in something into the cement wall. <laughs> yeah, you have that, and then I had dogs drinking, so we got we got some <laughs> background noise stuff. Multifactorial today. Yeah, exactly. So whoever's uh, yeah. So if you are <laughs> distracted as we are, you might need some folate today. <laughs> Distraction methods, methylations. Yeah, exactly. Distraction. <laughs> yeah, did I take my um folate? I did actually. I took a, a decent multivitamin this morning, so I should be I should, I should have something to to keep my attention on track, you know. <laughs> as long as I'm not too toxic. Um yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, any other like kind of clinical pearls? Because I think that part is really interesting. That's sort of what like captures our attention and our our excitement around this. This is why I get and I, I probably work backwards clinically with this kind of thing where someone will be describing that sort of phenomenon and then I start to think MTHFR versus just ordering a blueprint. Um, and I know that maybe that's not how you got, how you we... hear your question because it is so absolutely loud. <laughs> <laughs> Can you... <laughs> it's good for the audio though it's not it's not super overwhelming in in the audio yeah, input. yeah. <laughs> it literally sounds like someone's drilling into my, in my apartment <laughs> so, okay so clinical okay. pearls around like how to kind of either mm -hmm. spot it or support it yeah or like what what you sort of see when you're when you start to think mthfr in a patient or even just like what you've seen um are manifestations of it because i think that's really interesting like we you know especially with mental health it's really um, subjectively diagnosed, right? So people are, there's no blood test, really. There's no, there's no objective data. There's no physical exam or imaging you can do to say if you have depression or bipolar. So it's a subjective test. And so a lot of people who are between diagnoses, they're not really fitting into the diagnostic category, um, can be troubled by that maybe. But I always start thinking of things, you know, you can have two people with the same SNP profile and very similar symptoms and one could maybe be manifesting more on the side of ADHD and another person more depression. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, you know, let's forget about the diagnosis if it's not helpful and let's understand a little bit more deeply like how it shows up for you, you know, yeah. how your struggles show up for you. Um, and sometimes so I can point jammed folate cycle. So that's like that first piece where the MTHFR gene comes in can be like that hamster wheel worry. So like I worry about something and I worry about it constantly and no matter, even if it's resolved. So a good example, my, my husband's MTHFR. So like he was worried because he had to move um, with the military and like he had a place to live. Everything was resolved. And he's like, so worried about it. And I was like, what part are you worried about? And he's like, I don't know. I like, I can't stop worrying. 
And so that's like that hamster wheel worry about something that's even maybe resolved. Um, or it could be like that downward spiral mood, mood where someone says like, this is the worst day ever, right? Um, or I have to continue to increase my antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication because it's not working. So it works, but only works for a little bit and then it goes away. Um, it could be anxiety with no reason. I'm sitting in my living room and all of a sudden my heart starts fluttering and I feel like super anxious, but like nothing has triggered that, right? If there's no reason for that anxiety or similar, like no reason for the low mood. I woke up this morning, everything was great. I was walking my dog and then all of a sudden, like I just felt really, really sad and there was no reason why, like nothing happened out of control. Mm. Um, high B12 in their blood. So lots of people will come in and be like, oh, my B12 is crazy high. And my, my medical doctor is so concerned. Um, it often means, so B12 is in the second bike wheel. So the bike wheel that's moving. If the folate wheel can't connect with the B12 wheel, then the B12 wheel just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so sometimes that's one of the reasons why we see people that are methylating or people that have a high amount of B12. Mm -hmm. Or... Um, low urine B12 with supplementation. So um, some people will run urine tests that show the amounts of vitamins that are in it. And even though someone's taking B12, it's high in their blood, it's low in their urine. That tells us it's like it's being stored but not being moved. Mm. Um, OCD is another one, right? OCD, because it's the same kind of like the hamster wheel spin where we get like the over and over and over again, but we can't, um, we can't move it. Or um, low energy, even with B vitamin supplementation. So it's like, it doesn't, doesn't seem like what works for everyone else doesn't seem to work for you. Mm. Um, a big one, uh, when my husband was quite bad. I remember this one day we were driving in the grocery store, like our cart down the ketchup aisle and this guy like bumped into our cart. This is like way pre COVID. Um, bumped into our cart and my husband is like turned around he's like you want to go and I was just like he bumped into our cart in the ketchup aisle it's totally okay like there was like all these things in the aisle like it was inevitable someone was going to run into us it's um, the ketchup was like, yeah. just so angry so fast that I was like I feel like something's not quite right um like when you go from zero to like 60 fast and furious kind of response mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um or the opposite like so oh my god like I ran into my cart I feel awful like oh my god I was in the way and like it's just something that most people wouldn't ruminate on that that becomes like really mm. big mm -hmm. eye contact's another one that's largely because of like eye contact being related to um, not being able to focus very well, like energy in the eye. Mm. Um, or you talk to someone and they seem like they're somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> like mm. low attention span and motivation. I'd say like all of those are kind of like just ways that I see it manifest in people. And so I'll like kind of ask you like, oh, like what's it like when you worry? Or, you know, um, oh, it, or people will come in because they're worried because their B12 is high. And then I'm like, okay, like what are you taking? And so at least that way we kind of like have places to anchor it in to be like, oh, okay, that's sort of like what happens. Mm -hmm. um, or they'll be like, oh, I took folate because I read that it was good for MTHFR and it was awful. Mm -hmm. um, and then I aggravated and <laughs> I became more anxious, mm -hmm. uh, which the antidote for that is just to take niacin. So B3. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. And you just take it every 30 minutes until you get relief. And niacin basically just uses up all the extra methyl groups that were created. So we're just like span the wheel too fast. We're just like taking it back, taking all the energy back out. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah, so it's because sometimes it can almost manifest as perhaps not mania, but it like now you're over uh, methylating dopamine, right? And so the dopamine is, uh, you're getting too much dopamine, maybe. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Or people just feel like, um, I had one guy, so a name brand grocery store version of a B100 vitamin. Um, oh, had no. <laughs> a lot of folic acid in it, which is different than folate. Yeah, and, and we're definitely going to folic acid. Um, folic acid doesn't spin the wheel as much as it jams the wheel. So instead of that bike tire moving smoothly, now you've stuck a broom in it. <laughs> Yeah. and and now you're still trying to spin it and stuck the broom in it and he aggravated really really badly and he wasn't under my care at all he like literally called me because he was searching for something about this and my name came up on a website and he called me um, and he was like oh my god what do I do and like in that moment <laughs> I was just like okay do you have niacin like just take a bunch of niacin like everything's gonna be okay and then but because 
B vitamins, I kind of even put them in that state to begin with. He was like really hesitant to take it. And I was like, no, you're just going to have to trust me here. Like it's going to make it better. No, it's a different uh, B vitamin. Yeah. yeah. And it ended up like he had been taking these B vitamins, um, this brand of B vitamin because he wasn't feeling well and he had not a lot of energy. And he read somewhere like B vitamins help with energy, which for the most part, yes. But because he also had this sort of genetic predisposition, it was high in folic acid, which like jammed everything up and made it look so much worse for him. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the, like the working with a practitioner helps because at least they can figure out like, what is happening? How do we fix it? Like, what can you expect? But also like, what does this mean? Um, because lots of times people just going on what helped for someone else that had anxiety or helped for someone else that had depression, um, doesn't always help for them because the blueprint's different. The mm -hmm. windows is different, right? And so sometimes it is that like being able, I don't know, I have a colleague who said like, if you're doing something on your own and after three months, it's not better, it's time to call in someone else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. Like it's a lot of runway for someone to try stuff and still like figure out what's working or not working and collect information. But mm -hmm. like, if we um, keep going down the same path and keep just accumulating like, and I'm sure you've had patients that come in with a like, suitcase of supplements, um, and you're just like, well, maybe, maybe this isn't the problem. <laughs> um, um, it's not, you know, is there the magic pill? It's like, what else is in the way, right? It, do you have mold? Do you have Lyme disease? Is your gut off? Is there something else? Is there lots of emotional trauma in your life? Um, how has that affected all of the components of that? Right, right. Yeah. Right. And, and I think that's actually great. The three month thing, because I love it when people can kind of take their health into their own hands, but I know, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm in line at the supplement store, looking at what people are buying, you know, try not to be too judgmental, but kind of like, mm. and mm -hmm. I think that the B complex, like the B 100 from whatever grocery store brand <laughs> is, is a classic example of that. And actually that's why I was like, really wanted to have this conversation because I, I talk a lot about folic acid versus folate with patients. Yeah. So they're like, oh, I just went and, oh yeah, you recommended this B complex and I just went and got this other one because I ran out of the one you recommended. Is that, and I, you know, a lot of the time I will always tell patients like you can kind of go nuts with whatever brand of D drops or N acetylcysteine or vitamin C or whatever. Like I'm not too picky about certain things, but with the B vitamins, uh, that's one that you definitely have to follow the brand I'm suggesting. But, um, and then, you know, then it, then they get the whole lecture, <laughs> which we'll probably get into right now. <laughs> but actually, before we get into that, I was just curious, why would folate cause an aggravation? Is it because it's it's spinning the wheel too quickly? Uh, it's because folate actually, it, in like, full, like, so methylfolate, it can cause an aggravation because it actually feeds the gut bugs. And so then the right. gut bugs off gas and the off gassing is the anxiety feeling. Um, so it's like, we are, it's like, it's like why people have low iron, even though they take iron, if they have bad guts, it's like the bugs eat the iron right. and you don't get it in. But like, it's not that you can't have folate cause you still need folate. It's more that if we put in a whole bunch all at once and there's something in there that's also using it as fuel, then it also has a reaction. Mm -hmm. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. There's a lot of things like that. I think like, like you mentioned iron, iron as an example. And then I'm thinking of like choline and TMAO. Um, so choline's another like important um, compound for, it can help with methylation too, but then it can also be converted into stuff that's not so great for us by a dysbiosis. Um, and that's really interesting, right? I think it just comes back to like, what's the state that your body's in and the genetic, um, blueprint is not always going to tell us how you're going to respond to something or if, whether something's good for you, whether that thing is the cause of the problem that you're, that you're experiencing. Right. And yeah. in a lot of people that get an aggravation, our test to like figure out if they're better is put it back in and see if it actually works. Yeah. Um, because in their blueprint, it should work, right? There should be a door there. There should be a window there. And if we clear all of the junk out of the way and we put the, the now can the door open? You know, oh yeah, now the door opens. So that's like almost like a, it's a good test for them to be like, oh, all the work I did actually made this different. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like a real like physical feeling for them versus just like, I don't know if this is working, not working, right? So sometimes, even though it's weird to go through an aggravation, if we can aggravate it, but then get it back in, it feels good. Mm -hmm. I had a, a woman that aggravated one time from magnesium, which is fairly rare. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, to the point where she was like, 
so cramped up that her husband had to carry her up the stairs to go to bed. Um, and I was like, oh, darn. <laughs> and her husband is a physician. So I was like, oh, that's so <laughs> um, And uh, it ended up that is similar to, to the other woman who aggravated with the folate. It was that her gut bugs were so bad that they actually made magnesium toxic. Mm-hmm. and we saw the pattern over and over and over and so when I start seeing people that have like lots of symptom aggravations with supplements or with food then I'm like wait a second okay this is something making a poison mm-hmm. um, and so and that only really came because that all these weird people that had this happen and then I was like okay they can't all have the same problem so what's going on and so it had nothing to do she desperately needed magnesium um, but her body wouldn't allow it to come in yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's really interesting because I think that's super helpful too, because sometimes when you see a new patient, you're like, well, where do we start with, with hormones, with gut, with, and then, you know, if you see an aggravation like that, you're like, okay, it's a no brainer. We're going to start with your gut. And maybe you don't even need to be on supplements after we've, we've healed things, you know? For sure. Yeah. Goal is always to be on way less. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're on like 10 things that you you may just be able to absorb from food. If your gut gets sorted out, that would be great, right? That you don't need to take those 10 supplements anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. That's really cool. And so let's, let's dive into the folic acid versus folate or the methyl five methyl tetrahydrofolate. (laughs) So why do we say don't take folic acid, but your medical doctor told you to take folic acid? Yes. Why are you told to take folic acid? Exactly. Yeah. Like when you're pregnant, why are you told to take folic acid and why should you not? (laughs) This is all right. So folic acid, folic acid came into the picture in sort of the 1940s, 50s. And It was recommended by medical community based on people getting um, neural tube defects in children, which is like that their brains basically really weren't developing. Um, Ironically, let's put context, around the same time we saw fast food chains coming into play, we had lots of toxicity, right? Because there's people that went to the war, lots of people that needed munitions for the war, we had lots of factories. And so our environment was dramatically changing from the way we used to eat, which was like farms and land into this more industrialized space at the same time. And so folic acid was a resolution for that. So what they found was that when people took folic acid during pregnancy, they had less of the small tube defects. Ironically, around the same time, we also saw increasing rises in cancers and autoimmunity and Asperger's and anxiety and, all, and autism and all of these conditions. Um, and so when we started delving deeper, we're like, okay, well, what, what is folic acid and like, how can it be both beneficial and potentially harmful? So folic acid is a synthetic version of folate. So we stopped eating all those leafy green vegetables and we started eating hamburgers. And so the government was like, oh, well, we need to make sure that people get enough of these necessary ingredients. So vitamin D is one of those as well. We see vitamin D and calcium supplemented in lots of our foods, right? Our prepackaged foods are fortified with, um, which is like cereals and breads and um, lots of sort of those uh, butter staple products that people at the time were using most often in the kitchen, which kind of continued, you know, the sort of um, American diet for lack of a better way to describe it, is kind of like where we see those foods that are highly fortified. Folic acid is one of those things um, that has become fortified in the things that um, we are doing. Mm-hmm. And so uh, folic acid synthetic, so it's similar to, but not the same as um, having it in the diet. And so it is slightly different in shape. And we know shape is really important, right? We've learned that from the first part of methylation where we're like, oh, if our shape isn't exactly the same, then we are having a more difficult time um, calculating how to use it in our body. Mm -hmm. So I think about when I talk to patients about folic acid, I'm like, okay, folic acid is like a hotel card to get into the room. And so everyone's hotel card fits in every single door in the entire hotel, but only your door opens. Mm. Um, But you have the potential every time you stick it in the wrong door for it to get jammed inside. And if it got jammed inside, then the next person couldn't get into their room because there's already something in that hole. And so when you think about folic acid, because of its unique shape, the ability for our body to take it in is a lot less than the food version. And so we have less responders, less receptors to it. 
and it binds in a gene called DHFR. If the DHFR gene gets full, so if all those receptor sites get filled with folic acid and folate also then can't come in, what ends up happening is the whole machine just like slows down and stops. <laughs> So basically, we're doing all this stuff. We're putting all this folic acid in because we think that it's going to be beneficial for us, but we've just basically shut down the machine. And so that's that methylfolate cycle. So that's the cycle where we're seeing the methyl tetrahydrofolate actually help to build energy. And this is also how we build DNA. So when you think about children, that cycle is directly responsible for our DNA repair and replication. So if this suddenly started to stop, we can see why we would then subsequently have health defects. So the zipper can't zip in the way that we want it to. Mm -hmm. So instead of using the sort of synthetic version, we found that uh, when people started using the methyl tetrahydrofolate, which doesn't come into that top part of the cycle, it comes in way down at the bottom. So it's like bypassing everything along the way that might be broken or filled or not, not working in the way that we want it to, that the wheel actually still turned. And so it's sort of like if you were in the collector or in the express, right? You still can get to the next exit. You just kind of bypass all the things along the way. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, we actually saw better outcomes, so better outcomes in pregnancy. So um, one of the main causes of miscarriages is actually people over supplementing with folic acid who can't process it. And then we see miscarriage because the baby has too many of those defects. So the body's like, no, nope, this isn't a viable pregnancy. Um, and the literature actually is really complicated because lots of times it says folic acid but it means folate and lots of times it says folate but it means folic acid and so some vitamin companies when you pick up the package it will say folate folic acid and it'll say it on the exact same line i literally email every one of those companies and i'm like please clarify which yeah. one is it? yeah or is it both right yeah yeah so, patients will always ask they'll be like well it says folate i'm like yeah but in brackets it says folic acid so let's assume it's the synthetic crap <laughs> yeah and so it's, um, it's like learning the language. It's sort of like um, all of the different names for wheat, right? Same kind of idea where we're like, there's all these different names, but is it really the same thing? Mm -hmm. And part of the problem with folic acid isn't even just the supplementation of it. It's like that it's in so much of our food. So an average person on a day who eats just sort of a regular diet would get like more than 1700 micrograms of folic acid with no supplementation. So that's having like cereal with milk and like some kind of sandwich with bread and processed meat and a cup of pasta for dinner. That's like literally like a very standard meal. Mm -hmm. And so it may be not even that you are putting in things that add more folic acid in like that B100 vitamin, but just the foods that you've chosen to eat are already putting more in than your body can process. And so that's why a lot of times when we start taking things out of the diet that are high in this added folic acid and putting foods in that just don't have it or have natural occurring, that we see so much change even just with diet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like that substituted in piece. Mm -hmm. So generally, if anyone has any kind of mood stuff or trying to get pregnant or has bad energy, I'm just like, well, let's take anything that's as folic acid out of the picture and let's try to put in stuff that has folate in it. And really like at the end of the day, most of the products are like micro cost higher and sometimes not even higher. Mm -hmm. um, they just, it's way better if it works better for you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, putting something in that actually just makes sense is helpful. There's even like University of Toronto research actually about this. The, some of the challenges are they like chain, lots of research studies will say folate, folic acid, folate, folic acid, not realizing that they're actually two different things, but uniformly call them the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's a third kind called folinic acid. Um, which we used to be able to get pretty easily, which is now being coined by a drug company as a drug, which means it must really work, right? Yeah. <laughs> if someone's to make a drug out of it. Um, but folinic acid is sort of the, if we thought about the folate cycle being a circle, methylfolate is on the circle that kind of drives the bike forward, and folic acid is on the part that grips the ground. And folic acid, folinic acid, um, is different because it's actually the part that makes that DNA repair. So it's what comes out when you get a sunburn, right? You get a sunburn, your body has to send folinic acid out to repair your skin. 
And so if you have a sunburn and it doesn't go away for a long time, your body's less of that to be able to contribute to the repair and damage. Mm -hmm. Same thing um, when we see people that take a methotrexate. Methotrexate's a rheumatoid arthritis um, medication, but also a cancer drug. And the way that the drug works is to actually stop the replication. So it wants to stop folinic acid from moving. We don't want to build any more cancer cells. We don't want to build any more DNA. Great in cancer. In patients that are taking it for rheumatoid arthritis, they need repair because their body actually is damaged. And so when we're trying to, so we have the right idea by telling them to take folate. The problem is, is that when they take folic acid, they're still not getting the same outcome as we want. So we need them actually to take a condom that their body can use. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because it's supposed to go like folic acid, if it's working well, it should make folinic acid and then the folate, the the uh, five methyl tetrahydrofolate. But can we go backwards? Can we take folate and make folinic acid? Or are we bypassing that step if we're supplementing just straight folate? Yeah, I mean, we, what will happen, so it, it's not, so folinic acid is bidirectional, so it can kind of go both ways in terms of like being used for it by itself or being making methyl tetrahydrofolate, but methyl tetrahydrofolate doesn't really go back as easily. Um, but what would happen is like if you were supplementing and then also eating, then your foods actually could make your folinic acid and, because your body already has enough of the other thing to move forward. So it's like fills the gap that's most needed. Um, right. right. So yeah. So then you can, you, your leafy greens can go towards folinic acid instead of converting to the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're sort of like over, um, uh, not over supplementing, but creating an abundance a good reservoir of all the yeah. folate needs that we have. Yeah. Actually, yeah, folinic acid and the, and the hair connection because of the DNA repair, I know that it can be um, helpful for um, yeah. hair growth, yeah. eyebrows, like skin, yeah. all, the, all the aesthetic things we care about. I found this study that was like measuring like the folate, which was actually folic acid, that was in fortified products um, over a decade in Canada. And they found when they measured foods based on what the labeling on the package was versus what was measured, it was as low as 63% less and as much as 151% more. So when we think about that like amount based just on what's on the package, it could actually even be almost double that amount. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And it's in things like rice, um, wheat, corn. Or, corn yeah. flour sometimes. Corn flour. Yeah. So it's sort of like the flowers, the like kind of 1950s style grains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it sucks. I know. Is it possible that um, someone told me, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of this podcast on my end is like, someone told me or I heard um, that, that rinsing white rice can potentially rinse off the folic acid or is it in there? No. Oh, how no. is it put into rice? That is an excellent question. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I would guess like it wouldn't be something that like rice is like grown in water. So it's not mm -hmm. something that's like injected in or sprayed on. Right. Um, so yeah. it might be like an after spray. Yeah. Thing. And it is water soluble. So it's possible, but it just wouldn't be something that we would know. So I don't know if someone should take the chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know where this person got their information. It's like third party. <laughs> Information. Well, they do have to say it on the package. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the nice thing is like our packages are great as long as you're buying something that's in Canada and you can like, it's in English, right? And you can mm -hmm. read it um, to be able to know where it comes from mm -hmm. um, and what else is in it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like you're literally looking for the word folic acid, which is right. not complicated. It's not like 300 words. It's generally not shortened in any way. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll say that it was added. Yeah, or it'll be on the nutrition box. It'll say what percentage of folic acid needs, which is zero. <laughs> but, but what percentage of like of your daily allowance you're getting from it? And yeah, it's so frustrating when these good intentions go so wrong, and somehow we just it takes forever to course correct. And you're like, it. Why did it take more? Why did it seem to take less energy to put folic acid in everything than to be like, oh, we messed up. Let's take it out. And tell people to eat greens. You know? It's because like even even though there's research that says it, there is research that's misleading from before because they weren't really testing folate versus folic acid. And so until enough of that research like 
transfers over and people realize that they're not the same thing. Yeah. It's like, that's sort of like what will happen. It's like B vitamins, right? There's four kinds of B12 and we know they all actually work in different ways, but generally people just talk about B12 as this like combination. It's like apples, right? There's a million different kinds of apples and some of them are sweet and some of them are sour and some of them are are, um, like hard and some of them are soft. But we just talk about apples in general if we actually talk about the kind of apple that we like best, there is a, probably a specific kind. Mm. Um, and that's the same kind of thing in like vitamins, right? There's various versions of things where we're like, oh, this actual type works better for you. And that's that's why like working with someone to like learn all those things helps. Yeah. Like, no one else has to go to med school and we already went. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> let's help it like so let's help you break it down and figure out what's best for you. Yeah. And you're right. It is very confusing. I think I was doing some research on, again, I was looking at that oxytocin methylation and, and speaking connection. And it was a lot of research that was like, um, is folic acid the cause of autism? Is folic acid worse than autism? Is it good for us? So, and so it's like, you're getting this black and white, like back and forth of like, it's either the best thing ever to cure autistic symptoms or it's, it's causing it. And I think it's it's just because the the terms haven't been defined. Because are we talking folic acid or folate? Because yeah. one could actually be a big problem and maybe cause it if you're taking it when you're pregnant, and the other could maybe be helpful. Like if you're actually helping the person methylate, you may be improving certain symptoms. So it's like, yeah, it's like you know, I hate apples, and really, I just mean I hate green apples. <laughs> but all the other apples are great, you know. <laughs> yeah so confusing yeah and i think you know and and that's that's a frustrating thing about nutritional research because then you can you know it's like people are taking the wrong thing or they're writing off uh, a nutrient or they're saying that you know nutrition doesn't work because the the results are washed out in in that kind of data where it, in some people it's really helping and in other people it's um it's making them miserable. And I think a lot of uh, vitamin D research is like that too, where it's like, you're just kind of supplementing, you're not checking levels, you're not checking the status afterwards. It's not the right kind of vitamin D. The person's not converting it because of their magnesium deficient. And you're like, well, we didn't study anything useful in this, in this uh, paper. It's when people like say like, oh, I, I over-methylated. It's not really that you over-methylated. It's that the folic acid, all the hotel keys were jammed into the lock. And so it couldn't move. And so it looked like on a blood test, that you had too much folate. Blood testing can only measure all folates in like one pile. So they don't separate synthetic versus um, regular. And so it'll look really large, but it's not really large because you ate too many leafy green vegetables. It's really large because the synthetic piece um, just couldn't be processed. Right. And so like, that's when we, that's like the education piece where we're like, oh, well, this isn't actually what the problem is. Like this is like, the problem is that you can't, you have a traffic jam and all of this can't go in the way that it, we need it to. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, like, yeah. Over methylation is really just over folic acid too much folic acid in. <laughs> right so you're like over methylation is actually not methylating at all because you have no folate to methylate with so <laughs> it's the opposite yeah. that's really interesting yeah and then the aggravation is coming per- perhaps from microbiome which is it's not even a methylation thing at all it's interesting yeah, yeah because i i was um I think Ben Lynch talks about this. We talked about over methylation, careful with B vitamins, even the good quality ones that contain methylfolate. But it's really interesting to hear you say that. That's probably not what's going on. It's some other. Yeah, it's not usually the B vitamins. Like when our patients have ever aggravated and then we go to the gut, we're like, oh, this is the problem. And lots of times because you feel anxious or you feel low, like that's the last of your concerns. Like you're, you don't care what you're eating. We're happy that you are eating, right? Um, And you don't really notice about like stools or bowel movements or bloating or whatever else. But then if we can isolate it in a way where we can look at it, we're like, Ooh, like maybe I do have a lot of those gut symptoms that I didn't even realize that I had, especially when something goes wrong, when something goes wrong, then we can generally get someone to look a little further. Mm. So, and I always use the, so, you know, I'm Italian, my family, and, uh, and I often get, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you sort of profile patients, sometimes I get a lot of Italians, um, sort of uh, Canadian Italians with brain fog. It was for a while, I think there was a week, I had like five of patients that fit the same profile. And I was thinking MTHFR for all of them, because I think of like, so I don't know what the stats are, but I believe there is a connection between sort of Mediterranean heritage and 
um, and impaired or slower fully metabolism like NTHFR. I, I do have reduced function of that enzyme. Um, and I, I always think of like, you know, how were we, you know, what was their situation culturally a few generations back? There'd be a lot of like radicchio and, and those bitter greens and salads. And then yes, you'd eat pasta, but it wasn't fortified, not in Italy. And then you come to Canada, you're not really eating the leafy greens anymore because it's, you know, you don't have the fresh garden, the Mediterranean climate anymore. So you're eating like whatever it is, Ital pasta, fortified crap wheat. And so you're getting all this folic acid now. And, and so our genetic like predisposition in, in our environment are in a mismatch. And, and then there isn't that energy being produced in the brain. So then there's more inflammation, more brain fog, more mental health conditions, more exercise intolerance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I don't know if you, if you know, if you know that, like which kind of cultures tend to have more NTHFR, if there are those stats or is it kind of random? I don't know if there are like, I definitely know that in Canada, we see a lot more because we have a lot more multiculturalism. We actually see that as both being a blessing and curse, right? So sometimes we're starting to see like genetic stuff that we didn't see in that population as much. Like we see lots of Asian families right now that have autism in girls and autism used to be mostly in white male boys. Um, and so we're starting to see that even change a bit. Um, and that doesn't mean that all of their genes are the only reason why everything that's happening, but we do know that that's a commonality amongst um, individuals. Or we see like more cancers, right? And we know cancers is a methyl tetrahydrofolate receptor piece as well, because we're not repairing the DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, not the only reason, right? There's also all the stuff that's in our environment, but if we are like, okay, well, what, what are things that the blueprint baseline that we see that are changing? I don't, I don't know if genes care as much anymore yeah. about where we come from. Yeah. Right. And that's that actually makes cultural. Sense. Yeah. That, that makes sense actually too. Right. Because it's just like, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're, if you um, are coming from a culture where you would tend to eat this way and now here in Canada, you, you're kind of eating similarly, but the food is different than mm-hmm. if you had a genetic predisposition, whether it was, because of your cultural identity or not, it's it's going to be um, impaired now in the new context, sort of with the Italians. It's like you never had folic acid fortified pasta back in Italy two generations ago. Now you do. So now there's this this significant well, change. Yeah. Like European Union, right? Like the GMOs are like very restricted and they're like genetically modified foods. And I have lots of patients that like I have also kids too that here they'll like eat and they have to be really careful to learn gluten and all the foods that are like trigger foods for them for a myriad of different reasons. And their family goes on vacation and I'm like, it actually might be okay. Like if you're in Europe mm-hmm. and they'll be like, Oh, my kid was amazing. Like you've cured everything. They were perfect in Europe. They had croissants, they had pat pizza, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I'm like when you come back, they're not going to be able to do that. Yeah. And so they'll come back and they'll continue and they're like, Oh no, it's so different here. Right. And so um, some of those families will actually just like source actually products from Europe to be able to have some of those in their lives because it's important part of their culture or part of their diet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they recognize that the products aren't all equal. Right. Yeah. You're like, yeah, you're getting glyphosate saturated croissants here in, uh, in Toronto or Canada <laughs> versus in Paris, you know? Yeah. You know, it's unfortunate. It sucks. But at least, you know, like somewhere in the world I can eat croissants maybe. <laughs> no. Yes. yes. Go to France, probably be okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once COVID's over, you can go to France, eat croissants. Um, this is really great. Yeah, thank you. Any any last thoughts about you know methylation, environmental medicine? Any last things you want to leave us with? Yeah. I would say like one of the things that that people often do is like so once they hear something or they they find like this sort of glimmer of like oh this must be what's wrong, um, that they run out and get like they ask their MD for a folate blood test and they um, try to get their MTHFR. They want to know what their MTHFR stuff is. And I think helpful, they're both super helpful. The problem is, is that the folate is going to be representative of diet plus supplementation. Um, and it doesn't distinguish between the types. So folic acid, methylfolate, folinic acid. So just like being cautious of that, because if it comes back and it's super high and you're like, oh, I'm not even taking any, uh, it's likely food sourced. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
um, like the serum folate, it sometimes reflects more folate in the diet and RBC folate is like folate that gets into the cell. Um, but it sometimes gets into the cell from the diet. So it's not like, there's not like a definitive way. In the US, there's like a, a folate blood test actually tells you which types of folate are in the blood and it breaks it down. Uh, we don't have that access to that yet in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the 23andMe and those types of tools are amazing. They can tell you tons and tons of stuff, but you can also get really lost in a rabbit hole of trying to figure out what genetic abnormality is making whatever happening to you and i've had i've had lots of patients that have come in one lady she's still my record holder she was on 102 different supplements that she picked herself based on her genetic profile yeah. um and she was on a series of medications from her family doctor and i put them into an interaction checker which took forever mm. um because lots of them are combo supplements and everything interacted with each other except for three items. <laughs> so yeah. um, part of her not feeling well was her trying to feel better by adding stuff in. And because each of those things in her mind was associated with this positive benefit, she had a really hard time taking them out. And yeah. I was like, you can't take this anymore. You can't take this anymore. And so sometimes if we, if we see something and it gives us like lots of information and we think it's really interesting, like find a practitioner that just wants to explore it with you. And there's lots of us that just will have true conversations with people. Like, how does this relate? What does this do? What is context? What do we know about you and your family? How are things worked in the past? Because I think it can be super helpful. Um, but some of those like Facebook groups and like the forums and stuff, like the stuff I see in there sometimes is like so scary of what people are interpreting themselves and giving each other advice who don't have medical degrees and haven't studied it in any in depth. They're kind of just like learning themselves. Some of them is helpful. Some of it's totally helpful, but lots of it is like, oh, these people aren't going to feel any better because the following things are happening. Right. And so it's like sort of that three month rule. If I do something for three months, it's not getting any better, like call in someone else, whether that's a nutritionist or a dietitian or a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor, or someone who knows something more um, than what you're able to find on the internet. Yeah, just, yeah, which is good because I think like if a good take home from this podcast episode is that if this is going over your head, well, that this stuff is complicated and that, um, you know, a good practitioner is, is not just saying like everything is, is like even you, right? So you have tons of knowledge in this area and it's a, it's a clinical focus of yours, but you're like, you know what? I'm actually doing a lot more work with environmental medicine and gut health these days because I'm finding that that's actually the thing we need to work on first before all this. So, you know, anything, and I always say this, like I write Instagram posts on this and tell patients, like, if it looks like there's one answer, it's probably wrong question the credentials of the of the source that you're getting that from because nothing is ever just one cause and uh, and that's our job is to like scaffold a knowledge a background in molecular biology with biochemistry and then understanding some of this stuff and then even if the person is not necessarily focused in this area understanding you know what how to how to interpret the different sources of information coming through you know taking and i think there's like i mean there's lots of times that I get stumped and I'll just like be like, okay, listen, I got to get back to you. So I'll like have to like dig into reading something or think about it or call someone else. Um, and I think that's a hallmark of a good practitioner is not trying to solve all the problems in the visit to be able to say, listen, I don't know enough about that. Let me get back to you and figure out why that happened or what that is or if that's going to work for you. And I think, and I mean, not everyone has this, but like, a lot of my patients will like, they'll send me links. They'll be like, I watched, I listen to this great podcast. And like, you like, is this relate to me? Or you might learn something from this in addition to because they talked about a lot of stuff that we've talked about or, um, and it's that like collective learning that makes us all better. Right. Cause we're all starting from a place of good information instead of this, like, Oh, my doctor didn't do this. Therefore they're wrong. No, they just, like, I mean, I write doctor's notes every day that say, can we please change the folic acid to methylfolate? Here are the reasons why. Here's a video that explains it all to you. Here's some research documents. And at the end of the day, they're like, thanks for letting me know. Um, everyone can't know everything, but if each of us brings more information to the table, the better it is for everyone. Exactly. Like everyone can't know everything. And then it's, it's really just, I mean, a big part of our, our schooling was learning how to find an answer 
or a best answer with which to move forward. And I think that's good. That's a really good message to summarize this perhaps complicated podcast, but maybe not. Maybe people are already at the Methylation 101 stage and they just, <laughs> and they want to know a little bit more. And, and so it's like take homes are, don't take folic acid. So yes. throw away your B100 and then yes. see a practitioner. Not food. Yeah, yeah. If you're getting it in food, okay. Yeah, but at least don't take a B100 or a Centrum or whatever, multivitamin. And then, um, and then if you're, you know, try some stuff on your own if you want to. Um, and then in three months, see Christina or me or another it's ND or, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And every, I mean, most practitioners have some sort of like being agreed or something that you can like learn more about them on their website or mm-hmm. some way that you can figure out if they're the right person and I don't know, shop around, find the person that feels best for you because just someone isn't necessarily the right someone. Right. And we see that in the medical system. Sometimes we're like just forced to have whatever doctor has availability and can take us on. But if we're paying and we have choice, like find someone that resonates with what you need, whether that's you want to do genetics or you want to do fertility or you want to do gut health or you feel really anxious. Like there are people that do everything. There's like a naturopath that only does kidney disease. It's amazing. I know. It's okay. um, yeah. <laughs> every time I have a kidney patient, I'm like, just go to that person. Like, I don't even want to learn about all that stuff. Like that person's already got the market cornered, right? And so I think good practitioners will also do that. Send to someone who they think is better fitted. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah, if you do your free 15-minute consult with someone, they can help pinpoint point you in the right direction. Or, you know, I think it's interesting, too, like patients will come in with an agenda, which which can be great. Like, okay, you've, you've heard this podcast, you're interested in MTHFR, you think that might be the cause of your issues, so you're reaching out to someone who knows about it. But that practitioner might say, you know, yeah, that could be a thing, but I really am hearing a lot of gut stuff, and I my instinct would be to start there, and that might sound good to you or not. So it's about that conversation and finding that that connection with the person and sometimes something you told someone today they'll come back two years later and be like remember that time you told me this thing <laughs> I'm like I didn't believe you then now I do I have a friend who's a psychotherapist and uh, she was like you know um, we were talking about how sometimes patients will be like I always remember you saying this one thing and I'm like did I say that it doesn't sound like me but okay that's great and they're like I just I always think about it and it really changed my life and you're like great um, and so the psychotherapist friend is like She's like, one of my clients said, uh, oh, you know, the best thing you've ever said to me is, you'll figure it out. <laughs> and she was like, I don't even talk like that, but okay. <laughs> you'll figure it out. <laughs> She's like, after all my psychotherapy training and all of my conversations and listening and paraphrasing, that's, that's what I said that helped out. So you never know. <laughs> so it's all about fit, I think, is the point of that story. Yeah. Awesome. Christina, so where can we find you? So we can find you on Instagram. Oh, so my website, because I'm sure similar to you, spelling last names is complicated, <laughs> is uh, healingme.ca. Mm-hmm. And I, at some point, will be more visible on Instagram and blogging. I have lots of stuff started, but to be honest, a busy practice. So, um, but do have meet and greets if people, if people want to learn more or if people have information or just even want to like, just understand some of the differences between what they're taking or what they could take. Happy yeah. to happy help. Um, but there's also tons of um, practitioners that have done stuff in methylation. Some of them are listed on um, some of the methylation websites. So those are also good places and Mm-hmm. anywhere you can get like video and information I think is is helpful um, and we mentioned Ben Lynch making sure it's in context right nothing yeah. nothing is a silver bullet if it was we'd all be taking it exactly yeah then it, the answer would just be full late and we'd all go home so we yeah. wouldn't have jobs yeah <laughs> No. yeah but this is great so I'll put all that info in the show notes so people can find you see your Instagram which I, I assume will start to blossom because we're in the same yeah. uh, mastermind yes yeah <laughs> so You'll see lots of lots of exciting social media things from Christina in the coming months. I just need to listen. Yeah, awesome. So thank you so much. This was great. No problem. And uh, I hope you have a really good today is Thursday. <laughs> An awesome Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's long weekend. I have lots of like yeah. nuggets to talk to you. Yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. Like some some rest and, and reset plans, maybe, hopefully. Yeah.